Hey everyone, this is Jack from the Cardboard Herald, and I am joined by Kyle Frost of Give Pause Hobby today, once again coming onto the show to give you some hot recommendations and takes on various topics within board games. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a, a fun topic. I was excited excited the first time we did it, but I feel like making this list was even more just like, I don't know, crunchy in different ways. So it's it a fun ex- experiment on my own. It'd be fun to talk about it together and, and give each other, you know, the the criticisms of, are you kidding? That sure you would put on your top five starter? <laughs> yeah, so this is our top five starter pack games, which before I kind of get into what we're doing with that or the, the angle with which I took when I was trying to come up with my list, I did want to say you should definitely, if you haven't already done so, be checking out Kyle's channel. Give Pause has tons of stuff. And if poetry and Root the Musical and tutorials <laughs> on all sorts of Automa stuff aren't enough to get you over there, we did just record another top list, which was our favorite mechanics or mechanisms. Sue me if I'm doing the wrong one of those for you because people cannot come to an agreement on those. But you can go check out that list debuting at the same time that this one does over on his channel, which I'll have a link in the description below. So, starter pack games. When I first brought up this this idea with you, what direction were you going with this, Kyle? Um, so I there's actually been, you know, this this year that we've all lived through of being uh distant uh from everyone there has been a couple of times when in lieu of getting together with people and and say hey let's play this game there have been a couple of times where i have shot a game over to them you know Mm -hmm. for uh for a birthday or or just out of the blue um and so as soon as you said it i i i kind of went into that like what games without me being there um can i send and be confident that people are going to get the experience that i i typically have which, if we're talking about that, it's usually people who don't already have shelves and shelves of games. Because for those people, you know, you can just say, oh, I've really enjoyed this game. You know, you're sure to be able to pick it up. So, I was thinking more, you know, that they can take it on their own and, and get something out of it. And maybe even seek out more games like that. Totally. Well, I, I think that I've long held the opinion that there's no real such thing as a gateway game. I I think it's kind of a dismissive term uh, because it's a way of identifying simpler games, but also acting like simpler games don't have merit in and of themselves other than as an onboarding point. And also, I can think of tons of people who came into this hobby through heavier weight games. The best gateway game is whatever's going to catch your attention. There's a lot of people out there who have never touched a board game since Monopoly or anything who, because of their love for the Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or something, will look at Star Wars Rebellion or look at War of the Ring and be like, that's what I want. I play video games. I know what systems are. I know what combat is. Sure, it's going to be a lot of learning, but that's what's going to allow me to to access this entire hobby. And so I, I don't necessarily think that where I wanted to go with this list was specifically gateway games. I wanted games that hopefully are are fairly universal recommendations that are accessible but still provide a lot of substance that I think if someone were to build a collection around these games that they would feel satisfied even a few years down the road and not like these were just kind of hollow entry points that they decided to purge later on. There's no universal game that's going to work for anyone but these are the ones that just felt like they they kind of hit all of the marks and and would be really great starting points for people building out a collection so that was my mind of starter pack with that said kyle why don't you start me with your number five of your top five recommendos yeah and so i guess you know my my first answer to your question was probably not a very good one because it was just like my my feelings about when you first brought it up. But I did eventually bring boil that down to 
what you're saying, like kind of some criteria. And I'm uh, exactly what you're saying. I didn't want this to be something that is going to step over in the future. So I want it to be expandable or something that's going to stick with them. Um, I want it to be quick, uh, relatively quick, um, because, for, again, some people might come in at these really heavy games. But as a teacher uh, in my my day to day, that's like repetition is something that I'm constantly talking about. And if you have a game that takes 90 minutes, you know, that's that's going to limit how many reps a person can get on that. Um, and then a big part of mine that isn't in all of them, but is in this first one, is that the, the toy aspect, like the reason we are gravitated to board games as opposed to just, we talked about this in the other video, just go into video games. Like if you want a game, this one's, a triple a like title it's all these graphics but to be able to hold something in your hand and for that i chose santorini this was almost on my list really yeah <laughs> it, it had it 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 hit all of my uh categories it also um one that i forgot it is relatively inexpensive and mm. um four out of the five of these are are in that category which isn't you know hard and fast and everyone consider the like, money is different for everybody but it's it's on the cheaper side of things. Um, it scales with complexity so well in just the base game, um, which uh, which has heroes. You can play the game with none of the the asymmetric aspects, just like the going back and forth building towers, which obviously has a limited shelf span. <laughs> but then you, as soon as you break into those basic god powers, you're like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And then there's the more advanced ones. And then there's the expansion beyond that, which came in the Kickstarter, but now is available separate. But it's just, so it's a, it's an abstract. So it has that timelessness, but it gives the, I, the, the other beauty of hobby games, which is that there's a deeper theme, something, you know, there's artwork, there's the, the little, the little buildings that you're building them up. And the fact that it's on this like Island is just such a, a total package that Santorini, I, I still love that game. Um, and it's, just, it's super quick to, to uh, teach and you can never play just the one. And I think that right. that speaks to how good of a starter pack game, someone who might never play it before. is like, Oh, let's play this a couple times. Well, the, it's such a good game that you can introduce to almost anyone, even if someone has an aversion to these, hobby board games if someone's ever played checkers or chess or any number of classic abstract strategy games they can kind of latch on to exactly what's going on here and that back of the box pitch where it's like 30 seconds to teach and a lifetime to master i've never actually seen it pan out in quite the same way that it does <laughs> right. there because it does only take about 30 seconds to teach the entirety of that game but it is very strategically complex what i love about it is it's something that's simple enough for kids to grab onto. I have played Santorini at this point with my six-year-old and he is not, you know, some people are like, oh, my six-year-old is playing Scythe or whatever. And I'm like, get out of here. Sure, maybe your <laughs> Mensa six-year-old is doing that. My my kid who's still, you know, running around hitting, you know, the, the pillows in the house with plastic swords, you know, is still working his way up on some of those board games. But Santorini is something that he can understand what he's supposed to do, even if it's going to take him a long time to develop the strategic faculties to really nuanced, uh, to get that nuanced approach with it. Uh, so that, that's a great pick. Uh, as far as my number five, I, I started thinking about like, if I were to start over on a collection and what are the games I would want recommended to me, I'd kind of want some variety in the types of games. And one of the things that I think attracts a lot of people to the hobby is area control. For a lot of people, Risk and Stratego, you know, these conflict heavy games, um, Access and Allies are, are their reference point for board games. And so I was thinking about you know, you have the really heavy duty ones. You have Game of Thrones, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, you have small things like uh, Small Worlds, uh, for example, or Small World. Um, I think Blood Rage is a really good example of this. But one game that kind of hit on so many different 
notions of gaming for me was Rise of Tribes. It's a game where there's a very limited but very cool area control aspect. You have this civilization development that happens in under 45 minutes of gameplay. It works well at two to four uh, and it has an upcoming solo expansion, which to me is important, especially now in quarantine times. And as people are playing more <laughs> tabletop games solo, uh, I wanted as many of these to have a solo aspect uh, as possible. But it, it's just a concise boss. It, it's a concise box. It looks pretty and uh, it, it just delivers on a whole lot of different things. Uh, it's accessible, but even me as a really experienced gamer, I'm like, oh, dude, I can't wait to get bow technology in order to, you know, frag your dudes from a distance. Right. And that's that's a huge, um, you know, my wife and I talk about this on a regular basis. We've, we've been playing games together for a little while, um, quite some time. But, you know, the, the complexity of them has gone up and up as I've kind of gravitated. You know, I have a pretty varied taste. Um, but some of my favorite are the heavier games that originally she wasn't really interested in. There was a way to kind of forever a teacher to scaffold like the the approach to mm -hmm. not just dive right in and say, like, all right, now let's try root. Um, now let's try insert whatever here. Um, even something like Blood Rage, where there's a lot of these systems that you would need to teach to be able to say, OK, Rise of Tribes, here is it kind of just it's this experience of which there are many other games, which you can say, all right, pulls this experience from this game. Now, remember that other game we played? It takes this part of that, too. And I think that's a, a really cool way. And again, that might just be me as a teacher that I can like say, remember that lesson plan from a few months ago? Um, but yeah, it's a, I think that's a great way to, to sort of give them a glimpse of a whole part of the hobby with one experience. So mine is, uh, my number four is, uh, for a lot of people it might not be like the the best thing in the world because it, it's a lot of this back and forth but it's it's short it is uh easy to teach it is definitely cheap and it is expandable and it is dungeon mayhem um which if you want to be super reductionist it's it's sort of in the same category i guess you could say as like uh like uno where you're going around a table <laughs> and you have a certain limited number of actions and the the, the goal is to be the one person who wins but I think that's what, when I again, when I was thinking about these starter pack games, to to say, okay, we all grew up, or many of us grew up playing this list of of games that you know Uno is one of them, and Monopoly and and uh, Yahtzee or whatever, and sometimes that can be useful, sometimes it can be hindering because people just think, oh, it's just it's the board game that's just like the one I played in when I was a kid, but the fact that it takes such a simple system and it imbues each one with this like theme and it helps to have mm -hmm. Kyle Farron's art because that's always helpful um, and and puts them into these four classes and says like oh you have all these simple actions but some of you are going to be better at certain ones because you're a wizard or because you're a barbarian and it's just it doesn't take itself seriously at all and it shouldn't because it's it's simple it's expandable it has like the two different um, expansions the one with the monsters is awesome um and it it just kind of uh again because it's such a quick playing game and also people can get that kind of like ouch i thought i was gonna win and you stole it from me let's rack it up again and let's play it um dungeon mayhem i think it's one that has been one that i've sent out to people because it plays pretty well over uh over uh the internet uh as long as you have your own set you can play or everybody you know on either side has their own set there are very few cards that actually reference like someone else's hand uh it might say like discard a card but some of them do say like take a card into your hand and that one we need to do a little bit of work but the rest of it is just <laughs> you say like all right you're choosing the barbarian i'm the wizard and it makes it super super easy to play so right. that has been one that we have sent to people uh to our friends say in the after times we can play this together but right now let's get angry at each other through a webcam but that's dungeon mayhem <laughs> <laughs> well my number four uh, i wanted to do something with a abstract strategy and maybe like spatial arrangement 
uh, area and just, you know, things that are easy to latch on to. We kind of covered some of this with uh, your re recommendation of Santorini, but I think there's games like Splendor that come to mind, um, Century Spice Road or uh, Century Golem. Uh, you have things like Isle of Cats uh, or even Tiny Towns, I think, is a really fantastic one. Just this, this nice competitive strategy game that uh, people are going to be able to sit down and, you know, work their strategic muscles against one another without feeling that it's quite as conflicting as, say, like Rise of Tribes, which could be in this area, but has that kind of area control element as an aspect of it. And the one that I ended up latching onto most here is Kingdom Builder. This is a game that was a very early game for me, but is still like an evergreen in my collection that we come back to quite a bit. Uh, the new Winter Kingdoms is a, an extrapolation on this, though uh, from what I've played from it on Tabletop Simulator, I still think that Kingdom Builder is a little bit more concise of a package and has this this classic feel to it. It's ambiguously fantasy, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> there, there's very, very few fantasy elements, but it's clear that it's not within our world, uh, which I think is really interesting. Uh, it looks stunning on a table. And the teaching aspect where you say you're going to draw a card and that card is going to tell you a terrain type and you are going to place three houses on that terrain adjacent if possible and when you first play it you're like how is this even a game like what i i just i just draw a card and put things down but that adjacent if possible as soon as someone understands how they can limit their adjacency to things and then draw more cards and spread out across the board and pick up those unique power tiles that really dynamically change how you approach the game and it has the uh, alternate scoring conditions that three are set out at the beginning of every game. So it incentivizes different avenues for play. It's just something that as you play it more and more and more, you just kind of want to see more and more and more permutations of the game. And I think that's what really gives it legs compared to a lot of its contemporaries uh, and still remains one of my absolute favorite games in my collection. You mentioned one of mine uh, in that, and, <laughs> and it is in that same category for sure. And it doesn't necessarily have that that uh, the, the uh, random scoring that... Uh, kingdom builder has but century golem edition um for me is is on my list and it, again it has been one that we have sent away as a gift um it but i've taught it to to people on a pretty wide spectrum of how much uh you know history they have with the hobby board gaming industry and it's so it's so kind of simple of you know your actions are to play a card to take a card to capture a golem if you have enough uh crystals or to pick up your hands or pick up your your cards in your hands um and it's like that's it and then a little bit of explanation of the actions when you play a card um but it it the fact that it it works so cleanly that there there's no text there's no weird edge cases to be worried about <laughs> um it just it allows you like you're talking about with the adjacent if possible which i admit the first time i played kingdom builder i was like how is this a game um and then it goes oh and and the same thing with uh century golem edition which i will say definitively is better than the spice road <laughs> because it's just uh i mean the art is just i mean unless you're like really into trading in the mediterranean but even in the aspects of it like the art is different for each of the the card that if you play it it gives you three yellow gems as opposed to two those cards are different they show different things and they actually show what you get on them which i think is a nice touch it's not necessary um but it does kind of help just the whole package to be concise and when you're playing the game you know it is like i said it, there's not there, there's apparently a couple little teeny expansions um which are on the way i have not played with them yet but they a little bit more advanced cards you can throw in there but there's nothing else it's just the the game is what order the cards come out on the market and what order the golems come out that's it and from there there's still enough variety in how you approach this puzzle it's a it's a group competitive puzzle and for 
it's it's really easy to get people to the table and within a few turns they realize the gate the cards are not equalized there are cards in the deck that are just better and that's okay that's how the game is aside from when they're the the one that's zero cost at the beginning of the game you're like okay well the first player gets the best card and one of the best cards in the game <laughs> cool um so that's i usually hand wave and like you know reshuffle some of those in because then the market takes place or takes care of it because it costs more as soon as it comes out but it's even when we're playing more complicated games on a regular basis it's still one that my wife and i use as almost like a medit a group meditation right because right. sometimes we want to play a game we we love being around each other and talking but sometimes at the end of the day just like just kind of need to be together but in peace and but also competitive um and so we play this game silently and it's still great well, I think Splendor has that exact same thing where you have cards that are inherently better than other cards that are available. But I think even that is a really nice design touch because without that, you can kind of just focus in on whatever you're doing and just kind of automate that. By having things that are like too good a value to pass up, it provides an interruption to what you are initially planning to do. So if a card flips up and is like, um, I wasn't expecting an only three cost thing to come up. You know, I was working with all these five cost things. That is so good that I'm going to deviate my turn and disrupt what I thought was going to be like my next five turns in order to capitalize on this thing here. And I think it makes for a more interesting and less homogenous game, uh, which I, right. I think is just a great flourish about that. And for I sure. think that comes up in my next pick, which is I was thinking, you know, I, I play a lot of games with my wife. It seems like you are in the similar situation here. <laughs> but, you know, whatever your romantic status is, uh, you tend to, unless you're playing entirely solo, uh, have like a set of people that you're playing with and sometimes there's one person who you are particularly latched to that's that person that you go to and you're like oh i got this new game i want to show it to you so i want anyone who has a collection to have an extremely tight two-player game and th there are a lot of games that you could look at in this uh jaipur is fantastic if you want something that's really uh simple and easy to explain but is you know high impact decisions uh you also have like duelasaur island which does have a solo component uh, so i don't want to dismiss that uh, but for my money there is no better two-player game than seven wonders duel it is just such an incredibly tense and, and wonderful game that as you play it and reveal more things you start learning more and more about the consequence of every one of your decisions initially you think it's just i'm going to work towards one of these three parallel victory conditions either points at the end of the game maximizing my science or pushing the military but you start learning that it's not just what card that you take it's what you leave available to your opponent it's what you reveal how you approach what you draft is going to dramatically impact the options that are available to them and bruno catala is one of my absolute favorite designers specifically because when he uh, makes a game or in this case partners uh, on designing a game it is so much about very few uh, limited uh, decisions that, um, or, or I guess you have limited options that are available to you, but those are so impactful on anyone right. who's engaging with the game. And it's as much about the opportunity cost as it is any sort of material cost within the game. And Seven Wonders Duel just looks great. It made two-player drafting make sense in a way that almost no other game has. <laughs> it's very cheap, and uh, it's one of those games that I don't think is terribly complex to teach, but even with as many games as my wife and I have played at this point, we continue to wear out our copy of that game far more than we ever did with Seven Wonders itself. Yeah, I, this is actually on my my short list of games to to pick up when when there's a lull in you know kickstarters or pre-orders or whatever. Um, and it was it was actually on kind of I was thinking uh, it, I had to Valentine's Day, which we are just in uh, in the rearview mirror of, and um, 
but Canvas was uh, had just come in, and that was, we immediately latched onto that game as a it's not specifically two player, but something that um, kind of took up that amount of like space in our time. And uh, Seven Wonders Duel, I haven't Seven Wonders have not played have not played Seven Wonders Duel, but I've heard uh, obvi- like for a long time Seven Wonders is the game that it is. Um, but Seven Wonders Duel, the fact that it you know eclipsed. <laughs> the original in terms of ratings on BGG, I believe. I, I can't speak to the ratings itself, but it does something that the original didn't really do. I mean, the original is a fun drafting game and how many games are good at seven players out there and make sense and don't just take an abysmally long time. But the I, I think this this phrase or or sentiment gets thrown around a lot in reviews of Seven Wonders Duel, but there's no real better way of saying it is it's a three-way tug of war and every time you work on one thing you feel like you're falling back on the others and so it it just makes for some of the best tension in a concise little game that only takes about 45 minutes that that other games uh you know sit with envy uh when looking upon (laughs) you know there there are three hour big blown out war games that look at seven wonders duel and are like, I wish we could accomplish a tenth of what that game does in the amount of time that it does. Right. Um, so with, for my last two, I have I have new and I have old. Uh, and I'll go with the new one first, and that is Parks, um, which is typically a, such a big uh, genre as uh, worker placement, which this isn't, isn't exactly just worker placement. It's its own thing. Um, but Lords of Waterdeep was a uh, a huge intro game that I love teaching to people. Uh, quite a few people went out and got that copy, but there's a big stigma with some folks, clearly not me, as I'm wearing a root sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> but like the, to to truly like dig into kind of that side of the hobby of a uh, worker placement game that's kind of dripping with references to Dungeons and Dragons or fantasy and mm-hmm. you know all that sort of stuff. Um, and and parks obviously has none of that baggage because it's it's our world and they are actual parks that you can go to but beyond just the fact that it's not that other thing it is it's one its own wonderful you know experience all to itself the the artwork um to the the parks it just like draws you into the game um and it's it has nothing the the cards are just so much art that have no impact on the game is just to be beautiful. And and the pieces, like the little wild animal pieces, I mean, because animals are wild and they're used as wild pieces in there. I mean, they don't need to be like a buffalo and an eagle and a turtle or whatever, but they are just to make it look that much prettier. And when I got the expansion, uh, there are more of them. They didn't need to make more of those wild animals but they did. It's just like so, and the the inserts are beautiful. It's it all, it kind of shows people there's like just this whole side of of the hobby. Which if you're if you're suggesting something to someone who's not already invested, that's a big thing to say. Look at how how nice it can look on the table. Um, but then the actual game itself, it's it's so very clear what's happening. You, you know, you look and it's again very little text on lots of it there are text on like the little equipment things you can buy but the majority of the game is just where this like what symbols are available and in what order and and with that there's so much kind of tension in this like otherwise beautiful game so it's like lots of things wrapped up but you know beyond that the fact that it is based on the national parks it's an immediate just kind of like connection point that I have not experienced in any other games that I've introduced to people. And and when I do the wild uh, tokens, like every time, it's usually people give me like the big groan when I use puns, but I'm just like, and get this, the wild animals are wild. People are just like, 
that's amazing. I'm like, come on, guys. That's like the same type of dad pun that you make fun of me for all the time. Like, but yeah. it's it's just so delightful, the whole package. The, this one came up in my uh, thoughts, actually, uh, to kind of telegraph the number one that I have. But uh, it didn't actually make the, the final. But as I've been doing, <laughs> I've been throwing out all of these uh, different games for each of these topics because there's no one perfect game. And, you know, I'm more thinking about this conceptually than specific recommendations here but the thing about parks and that that touchstone is that learning a game especially for people who are new to the hobby is intimidating a lot of people didn't grow up in situations in which you felt competitive uh with other people and especially adult learners have a fear of looking stupid in front of other people. And so if you can give someone something to latch onto that motivates them to play the game that isn't whether you're going to win or lose and is just revealing new cards and kind of simmering in its beauty, Parks is a really good game and it's a very tight game. But being able to look at each one of those parks and be like, I've been there or I haven't been there or I've always wanted to go there, uh, is amazing. I mean, I, I'm Alaskan and like this, the the representation of Alaska in any sort of media is incredibly important to me because I feel like it, it's such, I mean, it's a literally huge part of the United States, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's not often uh, depicted, uh, period. And when there is representation of Alaska, it oftentimes feels exploitive or, you know, it's not necessarily uh, what I think of when I think of natural environments in Alaska. Uh, and they really nail them in here. And there's places where I'm like, dude, I've been there. And it's so cool. Um, and then I look at all the other places in the United States and I'm like, I guess that's cool too, but whatever. <laughs> If you're into the Grand Canyon or Hawaii or whatever, Yellowstone, I guess it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, a the, the fantastic game and such a great take on worker placement. The uh, catch-up mechanic of being able to take as many turns as you want if you go slow. Uh, woe be all the other players who have, you know, hopped to the most important actions ahead while I just go, all right, I'll take this action and then this action and then this action and this action. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you learned that lesson pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so my uh, number two here is uh, my entry point to board games as a kid was uh, playing Hero Quest with my older brother. Uh, he was awesome in that he let me play as the heroes, uh, mainly because he wanted to beat up on me with the orcs and probably sneak in too many traps than what the game actually called for. But uh, it, it also was a lot easier for me to manage heroes as opposed to the overall system. Uh, as the evil sorcerer but i think that uh, especially now with how pervasive role-playing games are in video games uh, and also this sort of notion of adventuring and a lot of people's touchstone for tabletop gaming being uh the the like dungeons and dragons type of paper rpg i think that it's very easy to introduce someone to a dungeon crawl or adventure type of game and it's even more so if it's cooperative uh, i think everyone should have some sort of cooperative game on their shelf uh, and if you like telling stories and you like embodying the role of a hero then the like adventure games and dungeon crawl games are where you're going to get so much fun out of it and i i thought there's you know some obvious go-to's you have like Journeys of Middle Earth, you have Star Wars Imperial Assault, um, which now has the app that allows you to play cooperatively, uh, which is great. Uh, Descent, uh, you also have the Arkham and Eldritch games. Uh, but to me, there's no finer package that is so easy to recommend as Gloomhaven Jaws the Lion. It, it's just it's affordable but it feels robust it has the brilliant gloomhaven system but takes a lot of the intimidation off of that uh by allowing you to go through this tutorial early on that simplifies the process the the accessibility issue that gloomhaven has and when we're talking about the the long form of 
games that people might start a collection around but hopefully be satisfied with later on down the road that leads you to integration with Gloomhaven proper. And if you want to talk about an abundance of content, <laughs> you, you, Ding. yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you can get that, that mega size box where you're like, I'm pretty sure this could fit 30 games in it on its own. <laughs> um, so you have the ability to go beyond that, but as a standalone package, Jaws of the Lion is still beautiful, accessible, and incredibly fun. I, I'm a huge fan of it. See, and I'm, uh, I, I've kind of haven't bounced off of Gloomhaven, but it hasn't. The, the my friend's copy, who I've played a number of times with, I've I've enjoyed the the times that we've done it, but it it never like struck right like the need for me to go out and try it. Um, and I have given the, as someone who is surrounded by board games in my collection, I have thought of uh, Jaws of the Lion as kind of like starter pack for me of the gloom yeah, universe exactly i haven't <laughs> haven't done it yet haven't pulled the trigger but like it's it is like you said it's all that that system kind of not not boiled or watered down it's just like a slice of it and from my understanding and watching my friends set up maps there are a, a vocal you know chunk of gloomhaven players out there who would love to have a book version of exactly. those maps as opposed to all the different pieces that you have to search for. Well, I think the popularity of Jaws of the Lion is impacting what Cephalofair is planning on doing with future content. I think they are right now in the midst of delaying Frosthaven, this new <laughs> Gloomhaven standalone game that is as big as Gloomhaven in order to deliver on those books. Uh, and I think they're even considering retroactively making some of those for the original Gloomhaven, which, you know, Gloomhaven ain't cheap, but I know I would still shell out the money in order to have the convenience uh, of the the book-based system over having to deal with all those tiles. Um yeah, for, for sure. sure. I did not include uh, anything. I realized I didn't include anything co-op on my list, um, but I'm not. I'm not calling an audible and doing anything different. I'm going to stick with it. But I do agree. If if I were to go at this list again, to maybe give that another thought, because it is really nice to have something in there for people to to build if they're building their their collection, um, a game that they can play that they they aren't head to head. And there are games that kind of sand down the edges. It doesn't feel so spiky, but competition still competition and as beautiful as parks is there are times when you get to the end of this beautiful game like oh how many points did you get and the person says something that's like 15 points more than you and you're like oh so i just did very bad okay <laughs> cool <laughs> so, so it's it is nice to just like ignore that but i'm not I'm, I'm plowing ahead it's it's my fifth and final and is it competitive again and it is an oldie but i think still a goodie and that is carcassonne mm, um yeah for it hits a couple things in in big uh big numbers for me which is it's relatively cheap you can get the the base set the the reprint of it um which has a couple of expansions that are included right in the box which hits the second thing which is it is as expandable as you want it to be it is like i talked about with santorini but minus the ceiling because there are tons of expansions that you can get that make it uh, a very different game and it's not a game where you're just going to buy expansions and just shuffle them all in you buy them and then you have them to kind of curate an experience you're like oh we're playing with this group so let's include the dragon or let's include the whatever um but also the 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 fact of what you're doing it is still competitive you are still head to head but you're building this really cool i've played it so many times over so many years with so many different people but it, every time I play it, there comes a point where I'm like, you know what? I want to put this down over here, but I also want to put it there because that completes that part of the map. Like, I just don't want that opening there because then when you're done, when you're tallying up the score, either before or after, you can just lean back and say, wow, look at this cool thing that we made. <laughs> All right, now how many points did you get? Um, but it's it's uh, it's really, you know, the the system, even within the base rules, whether or not you include the farmer, gives you this really cool switch of including or excluding one of the most like thought provoking, like delicious decisions of the game. Mm -hmm. But that's also kind of a big ask for like mental horsepower to just right. say like, we're not going to include that part. We're just doing cities, roads and the abbeys or whatever. And, and it, it just, 
from there you can say okay now let's add this other thing now let's add this other part or let's turn the farmer switch on and it's it's a game that can grow with you um and and i think that's a really important it's not going to be stagnant on your shelf it'll kind of you can make it whatever you want it to over the course of playing it you know carcassonne is one of my favorite games and I nearly had it on my list when I was thinking about those sort of, you know, spatial relationship, uh, lighter abstract strategy games. But I, I didn't put it on here because there's something about Carcassonne where when my wife and I play it, it's such a delightful game. And then we introduce it to someone else uh, who plays Carcassonne like a mean jerk uh and there is such room (laughs) for hurt feelings in carcassonne like even more than i i've never been so hurt (laughs) you know playing risk or you know any number of these classic bad feelings games i played sorry with my kid recently he got a copy of sorry and we've been playing that and he's like sorry and you know kicks my thing off (laughs) Nothing like, compares <laughs> to having this beautiful castle and then some being like, you know, it'd be a shame if I put a tile right next to that and my meeple because you're never finishing without me now. And being like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Or even they don't even put a meeple on it. They just expand the castle out. So now it's going to take three more pieces that I may or may not find in order to finish it. Or they, you know, take their farmers and somehow connect it so that they've encroached into my territory and being like, oh, man. you ate my lunch so bad. Uh, so I love Carcassonne. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't get me wrong. Uh, but the, there was something about it that... Uh, didn't quite work for uh how i was approaching this list but it's such a fantastic game the dragon expansion we i i i love that on the app and it's been out of print for a long time and i was like oh it's so expensive and when we just started playing carcassonne again i was like i wish the dragon thing was still around and i found the reprint for not super expensive and we got it and i it's incredible if you're into (laughs) just like being just like more in people's faces and i remember talking about it on a group and it was like that's the one expansion I hate <laughs> for that exact reason. Like it takes this game of Carcassonne, which is like, but the world they're talking about was never there to begin with. Because you can always you could double down on cities. You can put tiles. You're like, good luck finishing it now. But the dragon just like becomes this embodiment of like, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna exactly go over there and like eat your lunch with this dragon. And so yeah, it, but if you if you say like you know let's play this game, but like maybe without the dragon this time, it's uh there is still that like if you're playing in bad faith and you're going uh to be kind of a jerk you can't really remove that but uh you know i suppose you can add that into really any game almost any game well before we get to my number one here i wanted to turn it over to a few audience picks because i reached out to twitter to find what people had to say about starter pack games so max emnity uh mnt Wazda, so obviously we're including some first-person shooter there, has to say the crew, Azul, and Parks. So you have some more backing on Parks here. And then Daniel, uh, as far as accessibility, portability, and price, I think the Mind, Point Salad, Silver and Gold, or the crew could all make that list. Games that could be taken anywhere tend to get played way more with us. Uh, And then fellow Alaskan, or I guess semi-Alaskan at this point, but grew up in Alaska, Michael Dunsmore, who is a game developer and game designer uh, in his own right, says, my go-to gateway games are getting new players hooked. Uh, No, my go-to games for getting new players hooked are King of Tokyo and Karuba. And I think all of these are fantastic recommendations here. And King of Tokyo is one of those ones where even though it's just a great entry point to uh, gaming, still gets play as long as you have enough people to reasonably play it. You know, so it's a game for the after times. Right. (laughs) So my number one, I wanted to get into a game that is like a a meatier version of that abstract strategy that I was talking about earlier. Uh, I love Euros. Uh, I like when they're thematic Euros. Um, But, you know, I, I wanted something that people could feel are 
is really rich uh, and they could continue to you know, hone their strategies and explore the game more uh, and feel that uh, the, the complexity isn't necessarily coming from the sheer amount of systems in the game, but the, the sheer amount of interaction that you can have with it and the variance in one game to another. And while I did initially think about like Concordia uh, for this or many games that are kind of similar to Concordia, maybe uh, Marco Polo 2 or the original Marco Polo, if you like bad games. Um, but uh, worker placement is really probably my favorite uh, of this type because it, it's such a, a simple and beautiful way of uh, being able to show conflict in a game by taking something that is only available for a round and other players can't access it. You're not doing head-to-head -head combat in most of these games, but you are doing something that is directly impacting your opponent. Uh, so it doesn't have that bad taste of, you know, I am going to take away your units in the way that a lot of uh, conflict heavy games uh, have but you still are uh, heavily interacting with the board and your opponents as you play and, and there's a ton of options that you could have here um, as a starter game I mean a lot of people would say Agricola uh, I, I would personally recommend Caverna over that but I think those are still more complex than I would want someone to kind of access into the hobby uh, with um, and I think Viticulture Essential Edition is probably the game that made me think of this list originally because I, I think it's such a beautiful entry point into worker placement. It has a theme that's not offensive uh, to people who don't like sci-fi or fantasy or, you know, heavy combat or anything. And it also... Uh, has just enough complexity on its own that it feels rich. But then you can also add Tuscany uh, as something that really blows the game apart. That said, uh, in favor of accounting for some newer games, I, I'll fawn for just a second, as with everyone else, and, and say Dune Imperium uh, is just such a fantastic game. <laughs> I, I'm, for the most part, over uh, deck building as <laughs> a, a mechanism in a game, but the fact that the deck building is what impacts where you can go on the board as well as your resource generation and the successful integration of these three minor components, uh, the deck building, the worker placement, and a limited amount of area control through the different houses as well as that end conflict. None of them are particularly innovative in and of themselves, but the way that they have been integrated together feels so fresh and interesting that you can within a round understand how all these are related and how that's going to impact your way of approaching the game. It's a little bit more complex than something that I would typically uh, say, you know, hey, you've never played a game before. Why don't you just sit down with this? And the Dune theme, especially being a, a, a visual representation of the upcoming film is kind of an iffy prospect. You know, there's a lot of people who are going to be like, I'm just uncomfortable looking at a sandworm. You know what I mean? Uh, and then <laughs> there's some people who are <laughs> like, I don't want to ever play as Timothy Chalamet. Uh, you know, I, I want to uh, play as Paul Atreides uh, in Dune. Um, and there's some people who just don't like sci-fi fantasy, but still uh, I think it's a really interesting, really engaging game. Um, it looks good on the table. Uh, they didn't use stills from the movie. They actually commissioned some original artwork ranging from questionable to awesome. Uh, it's got that Sam Wormy goodness and it plays really well without being overly complex. So I, I think that that's absolutely something that you could recommend to someone to kind of build a collection around. Yeah, it's it's just, like you said, those those three kind of the the components that build this experience are are in and of themselves can be simplistic but the way that they work together is so good and that and it, it makes so much sense to say why would i want a certain thing in my deck or what's going to be more valuable and be like well where do you want to go and and to it's you can kind of like learn these systems in tandem with each other 
and the game you know beyond that is just fantastic so then you're you're left with not a game where you're like well this is a stepping stone to something else which i think we both tried our best to not do this is a game that the the deeper you get into it you say oh now you can try to go after this certain strategy or now you know how long you can put off this thing you thought that everyone needed to do now you can re- you find out i don't need that thing because i'm gonna do this it, it just has all these depths to it that um but it's not super super like you said it's a i guess maybe a little bit up the complicated scale but it's not that far right um, right you know what you, what you were just talking about my wife and i were playing the other day and she bought four cards a total of four cards and she crushed me those cards <laughs> We're all conflict based. They they were all leaning into that end of the round conflict. And to me, the instinct is when you're playing a deck building game, when you're playing a worker placement game, you work on your economy. You always work on your economy. And that has worked for me in that game. But the fact that she was able to solely put her focus on how can I streamline as possible in order to make end game conflict work incredibly well for me. Uh, and get cards that that didn't get her more money to buy the the spice must flow cards for you know points that are forever going to be allocated to you you know she just leaned into that and devastated me and it didn't feel like oh well this disincentivizes playing with um uh adding more cards it just felt like this was a really interesting strategy that was completely in in conflict with my expectations for how you have to play these games uh and to have several viable strategies within a game is to me an important part of what gives it legs and i I think that that game absolutely has it for sure a (laughs) hundred percent all right well that is our list our 10 games that you could build a collection around even if you only picked two or three of these if you are a new gamer you are probably going to be well served but if you are an experienced gamer or a new person who had your own entry point into the hobby who disagrees with us we definitely want to hear about how wrong you are um and uh if your opinion is in disagreement with kyle then i guess you're correct um but <laughs> i i do want to encourage everyone to now go and check out uh the give pause hobby channel there's all kinds of stuff on there ranging from uh poetic musings and you know entertaining silly things to incredibly thoughtful takes on games uh like i said we'll also have another one of these chats debuting at the same time up on that channel uh but kyle has a ton to offer uh that i think is only going to uh grow your prominence within the internet board game universe so i'm glad to have you on the show and uh thanks for running down this list with me kyle yeah thanks for having me on and thanks for saying my name more than i typically do in videos so maybe through osmosis i can remember (laughs) that i just need to say it more often so i'm not just my channel name i am actually a person as well but no this was a blast and uh and it it was i was had a lot of fun making the list but i think it i'm i'm having even more fun unpacking you know your part of it our interaction and like if i were to do it again what i might include so it's i think it's uh that's a good a good sign of a good top 10 list yep yep well thanks everyone who uh, gave their own recommendations uh, as far as Michael Dunsmore go Mustangs. You know, you can just kind of <laughs> deal with that. And uh, to uh, everyone who enjoyed this and wants to see more, we'd love to see some of your own uh, points of interest, discussions that you'd like us to have, either top 10 lists or they can be other things, you know, just like us taking on a topic to just gab about for a while because it's a lot of fun doing it. And uh, yeah. Thank you for watching, and once again, Kyle, thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience-supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.